Well, we made it to the 12th segment of Exodus. I don't know why I was, uh, we're going to close the book of Exodus, but we're going to move into Numbers. Uh, we'll, we'll spend a few time, a little bit next in uh, Leviticus, and then for the next few weeks, we'll be going through specifics in the book of Numbers. So we're going to look at uh, the golden calf. Uh, I've got little statues to sell for people if you'd like. Uh, but the golden calf overshadows God's continued instructions. God has placed many references as examples throughout the Bible of Moses and the children of Israel while in the wilderness for consideration. So 1 Corinthians 10, 1, there's like three of them right here in this chapter. So this is from the working translation. Moreover, brothers, I do not want you to be ignorant for the fact that our fathers were all under the cloud and they all passed through the sea. And that's talking about, uh, of course, the time of Moses and them crossing the sea. And it continues. Verse 6 says, now these things have become our examples. So what we're looking at are things that have become our examples to the intent that we should not crave evils as they craved. And boy, we got a big craving to start with. In verse 11, all these things happened to them as examples. And they were written for admonition for whom the end Ends of the ages have arrived. So just there in these 11 verses, you got three times God tells us he wants us to know about this material. So that's why we're teaching you. Moses has been summoned by God to come up the mountain to receive the tables of stone with the law and commandments in order for him to instruct the people what the will of the Lord is. Exodus 24, 12, New International Version. The Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and stay here. And I will give you the tablets of stone with the law and commandments I have written for their instruction. To the Israelites, the glory of the Lord looked like a consuming or devouring fire on top of the mountain. Then Moses entered the cloud as he went up on the as he went on up the mountain, and he stayed on the mountain forty days and forty nights. Okay, see, Moses is on the mountain. He goes up into it, but if you're standing on the sideline watching. You're seeing the glory of the Lord descend on the mountain, and it looked like a devouring fire. You know, and here's Moses walking up into this fog and fire and everything. So he's going to be up there for 40 days. And when they saw the mountain the way it looked, they concluded, man, that Moses just disappeared. Obviously, while he's up there, aliens got him or something. Uh, so we have to have a contingency plan. So here's what we should do. Aaron, you need to construct us a golden calf. Exodus 32. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we want to know what is become of him. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings, which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. And all the people break off the golden earrings, which were in their ears, and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool, after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. To play means to make sport, to dance lasciviously, all parts of idolatrous worship. A, a golden calf was constructed so they could rejoice in the works of their own hands. Since God is spirit, they couldn't see him and they did not like the way Moses was leading them. So given the opportunity, they went after Aaron. The ox is symbolic of strength and endurance. God is symbolic of power, glory, and excellency. Thus the golden calf was the deity of the material world and is still a god of those who worship money and material things more than their creator. When Aaron made the golden calf, he said, this is your god, meaning gold is the god of this world and without which no one can be free and happy. 
material things were their gods in Egypt. All gods of the Gentiles are made of silver and gold, the two most precious metals. The people who conspired against Moses believed that the future welfare of Israel depended more on gold and silver than on the unseen God who converses with Moses. Throughout the centuries, gold and silver have meant more to mankind than the living God and his truth. God now notifies Moses that something is drastically wrong in the camp. I wonder how he knew. All right, Exodus 32, verse 7 in the Standard Version. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down for your people, Moses. They're your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt. They have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly. I hate to see that because there's so many people who do that. I'll change my life. And then, bam, right back into it. They turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. They have made for themselves a golden calf, and they have worshipped it. They have sacrificed to it. And they said, these are your gods, O Israel, brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, oh, I've seen this people. They're a stiff-necked bunch. Now, therefore, let me alone. You know, it, it, this is, uh, you know, what God is telling, uh, you know, Moses. Oh, just leave me alone, Moses. Stay out of my life, Moses. Don't defend these people. I'm going to take care of them. All right? Just get out of my way, Moses. Leave me alone and let my wrath come down and burn them, that I may consume them in order I may make a great nation of you. Tell you what I'll do. I'll start over again with just you and your offspring, and I'll make a great nation out of you. How's that? We, we can get rid of these two and a half million people. But Moses implored the Lord, his God, and said, Oh, Lord, why does your wrath burn hard against your people? Moses is turning it around. If they're your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand, why should the Egyptians say, with evil intent, did, you know, did he bring them out? You brought them out for evil, for mischief, to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth. If you just leave them out there and they're all dead, the Egyptians are going to talk about it. And they're not going to talk nice about you, God. You know, Turn from your burning anger and relent from this disaster against your people. You know, Mo, Moses is telling remember Abraham? Remember Isaac? Israel? They're your servants to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven. And all this land that I have promised, I will give to your offspring, that they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord relented from the disaster that he had spoken of bringing on his people. Moses stands in the gap for the disobedient, idolatrous people of Israel. He pleaded their case before God, and the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do. That wasn't the case at the time of Ezekiel. Let's look at this, Ezekiel 22, verse 23. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto her, Thou art the land that is not cleansed, nor reigned upon in the day of indignation. There is a conspiracy of her prophets in the midst thereof, like a roaring lion, ravening thy prey. They have devoured souls. They have taken the treasure and precious things. They have made her many widows in the midst thereof. Her priests have violated my law and have profaned my holy things. They have put no difference between the holy and profane. Neither have they showed difference between the unclean and the clean. And they have hid their eyes from my Sabbaths, and I am profaned among them. Her princes in the midst thereof are like wolves ravening the prey to shed blood and to destroy souls to get dishonest gain. And her prophets have daubed them with untempered mortar, seeing vanity and divining lies unto them, saying, Thus saith the Lord God, when the Lord hath not spoken. The people of the land have used oppression and exercised robbery and have vexed the poor and needy. Yea, they have oppressed the stranger wrongfully. And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge build a wall and stand in the gap or the breach before me for the land that i should not destroy it but i found none 
Therefore have I poured out my indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Their own way have I recompensed upon their heads, said the Lord God. God looked, couldn't find one. God sought a man that would make intercession on, beh on, behind, <laughs> on behalf of God's people. But there was none. There wasn't anybody there who, was, who, who could do it. Today, Jesus Christ has already favorably made intercession on behalf of all of mankind. A lot of easier living today with the incession, with the, the person who stood in the gap for all of us, isn't it? But back then, he just looked for somebody. Moses stepped up for the children of Israel. It was time for Moses now to see firsthand what exactly was happening that so infuriated God and to rectify the situation. His job was to go in there and make things right. He was going to be the enforcer. Right, he's going to take four cops and they're going to go be the code enforcers. The people loved darkness and idolatry over the light of what God and Moses had been doing for them. Exodus 32 15. And Moses turned and he went down the mount. And he's got the two tables of the testimony that were in his hand. Notice it says hand. One hand carried both of the stones because the tables were written on both their sides, front and back. Right. On the one side and on the other side were they written. The tables were the work of God. The writing was the writing of the solemn or important writings of God, graven upon the tables. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said unto Mo Moses, there's noise of a war in camp. They're being invaded. Eh, wrong. And he said, it's not the voice of them that shout for mastery, neither is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome. But the noise of them that sing do I hear. And it came to pass as soon as he came near unto the camp that he saw the calf and he saw the dancing or the singing, the dancing and singing as in worship of Apis. Uh, and Moses' anger waxed hot and he cast the tables out of his hands and he brake them beneath the mount and he took the calf which they had made. He burned it in the fire. See, the gold was defiled. So Moses had to purify with fire. And he crushed it. He beat it to powder. And he scattered it upon the water and made the children of Israel drink of it. Now, there was a brook that descended from the mount that was needed for all the people and animals to get water from. They, they're going to be 10 months at this area. Deuteronomy 9.21. And I took your sin, the calf which he had made, and burned it with fire and stamped it and ground it into very small, even until it was as small as dust. And I cast the dust thereof into the brook that descended out of the mount. Now, there have been many petroglyphs. Yeah. Petroglyphs are rock engra engravings on the golden calf altar of Apis and Hathor. Hathor is the Egyptian cow goddess. Mm -hmm. Something as long as six feet across on the altar that where they did the golden calf, you got 12, actually it's 12 petrographs, and some of them are six feet across. They're that big, mm -hmm. right? They're not paintings, but they're... Um, they're, 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 they're drawings, engravings, okay? Uh, artisans, while in bondage in Egypt, probably made similar Apis bull statues, so they knew how to draw and forge them. Uh, back to Exodus 32, verse 21. And Moses said unto Aaron, What did this people, what did this people unto thee, that thou hast brought so many, so great a sin upon them? And Aaron said, Let not the anger of my Lord wax hot. Thou knowest the people, that they are set on mischief or evil. For they said unto me, Make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what is become of him. And I said unto them, Whosoever hath any gold, let them break it off. So they gave it me. Then I cast it into the fire, and there came out this calf. And when Moses saw that the people were naked, for Aaron had made them naked unto their shame among their enemies. It's really the people's fault, right? Can't, not possibly my fault. It's really the people's fault. You know, the term naked metaphorically means ashamed. Aaron had caused them to sin and that he had made them worship the golden calf and the sacrifice to it. When Moses saw them, they were ashamed of their evil act. Moses had to crush this rebellion quickly because the leaders of it would have convinced Aaron to have their God, this golden calf, lead them back to Egypt. 
since they were so dissatisfied with God and Moses and Aaron's leadership and with all the hardships uh, you know, they were enduring. All right, verse 20, not 26, English Standard Version. We're on page four of our handout. At the bottom of the page, then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, who is on the Lord's side? Come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered around him. And he said to them, thus says the Lord God of Israel, put your sword on your side, each of you. Go to and fro from gate to gate throughout the camp. And each of you kill his brother and his companion and his neighbor. Right? And you know, all of those who disputed the leadership of Moses, go after them. And the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses. And that day about 3,000 men of the people fell. And Moses said, Today you have been ordained for the service of the Lord, each one at the cost of his son and of his brother, so that he might bestow a blessing upon you this day. So on the day that the law was introduced, about 3,000 men died. The law brought death. On the day the spear was introduced, you know what happened? About 3,000 gained eternal life. Look at Acts 2.41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. The day the law was introduced, it brought death. About 3,000 died, but the first day the Spirit became available, it brought life. About 3,000. What a contrast. 2 Corinthians 3, 6. Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the law, the letter of the law, but of the spirit for the letter or the law killeth but the spirit giveth life well there's your example god rewarded the zealousness of the tribe of levi on his behalf by negotiating a trade he now wants the children of levi instead of the firstborn of israel to be set apart for service to him numbers 3 12 and 13. and i behold i have taken the levites from among the children of israel instead of all the firstborn that openeth the matrix among the children of israel Therefore, the Levites shall be mine, because all the firstborn are mine. For on the day that I smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, I hallowed unto me all the firstborn in Israel, both man and beast. Mine shall they be. I am the Lord. But God didn't just take them. He didn't just, you know, walk in and go, okay, I want you, 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 and you. He <laughs> traded for them. And then he paid the redemption money for the extra 273 of them. God's a just God. He bought them for his work according to the price he had early attached to their value by age. And you can see that in Leviticus 27 and Numbers 1. Numbers 339. All that were numbered of the Levites, which Moses and Aaron numbered at the commandment of the Lord throughout their families, all the males from a month old and upward, were 22,000. And the Lord said unto Moses, number all the firstborn of the males of the children of Israel from a month old and upward, and take the number of their names. And thou shalt take uh, the Levites for me. Uh, by the way, I am the Lord. I'm doing, I want this done. I want them instead of all the firstborn among the children of Israel. And the cattle of the Levites instead of all the firstlings among the cattle of the children of Israel. So they numbered all the cattle, cattle too. Moses numbered, as the Lord commanded him, all the firstborn children of Israel. Firstborn males, the number of names from a month old and upward of those that were numbered of them were 22,273. And the Lord spake unto Moses and said, Take the Levites instead of all the firstborn among the children of Israel, and the cattle of the Levites instead of their cattle, and the Levites shall be mine. By the way, for about the 17th time, I am the Lord. <laughs> and for those that are to be redeemed of the 203 score and 13 of the firstborn children of Israel, which are more than the Levites, all right, thou shalt even take five shekels apiece by their pole, after the shekel of the sanctuary, that thou shalt take them. So there are 273 more people, all right, than there, there was Levites. So God's char charging, you know, them five shekels apiece. And he, and in case you're wondering, a shekel is 20 garars, in <laughs> case you're trying to you know, get it properly. Now, you should give the money wherewith the odd number for them is to be redeemed, and Aaron said and, uh, unto Aaron and to his people and the sons. Moses took the redemption money of them that were over and above them that were redeemed by the Levites, 
of the firstborn of the children of Israel, he took the money, a thousand three hundred and three score and five shekels after the shekel of the sanctuary. Moses gave the money to them that were redeemed unto Aaron to his sons, according to the word of the Lord as the Lord commanded them. So the, the 273 extra people, basically, he bought them for a, a, a price of five shekels each, gave the money to Aaron to take care of that. God didn't just say, ah, forget about it. Uh, you know, it, it's close enough. No, he specifically paid for the extra ones. Now, Moses returns to God on the mountain in order to plead for the children of Israel. They just broke the first two commandments. They haven't had the commandments that long. And so what they do? They got a good start to a good start. They broke the first two. But again, we see the compassion in the heart of this great man. Exodus 32, 30, English Standard Version. The next day, Moses said to the people, you have sinned a great sin. And now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. So Moses returned to the Lord and said, Alas, this people has in the great sin. They have made for themselves gods of gold. But now, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, please blot me out of your book that you have written. But the Lord said to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. But now go, lead the people to the place about which I have spoken to you. Behold, my angel shall go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. And the Lord sent a plague on the people because they made the calf the one Aaron made. And another 23,000 people will die because of the plague that followed. 1 Corinthians 10, 7 and 8. Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. That's where they get the twenty three thousand from. Exodus 33 1. And the Lord said to Moses, Depart, go up hence, you and the people which thou hast brought upon the land of Egypt, unto the land which I sworn to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And I told them, Unto thy seed will I give it. I'll send an angel before them. I'll have the angel drive out, you know, the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And I'm going to get you into that land flowing with milk and honey, which is a figure saying a land of all kinds of good things. For I will not, God's saying, I will not go up in the midst of thee because you're a stiff-necked, stubborn, obstinate, headstrong people. I got better things to do. <laughs> unless I consume thee in the way. I love that. Because of the idolatry at the Golden Calf incident, God said, I'm not going to go with you. I'll get you there. I'll send an angel and he'll, he'll take care. He'll get you there. I will fulfill what I said I would do to Abraham. But for me, I've had enough. I'm just going to get so mad at you if I keep going that I'm going to consume you along the way. You know, you're on your own. Once the angel drives out the inhabitants, nice to <laughs> you. So, Bob, what does Moses have to do in verse 4? When the people heard this disastrous word, they mourned, and no one put on his ornament, a sign of mourning and repentance. For the Lord had said to Moses, Say to the people of Israel, You are a stiff-necked people. If for a single moment I should go up among you, I would consume you. So now take off your ornaments, that I may know what to do with you. Therefore the people of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments from Mount Horeb onward. When Moses told them that God was going to consume them for their rebellious, <laughs> idolatrous actions, oh, they humbled themselves quickly. You know, that's putting the fear of the Lord into them. The other kind of fear of the Lord. <laughs> Verse 7. And Moses took the tabernacle and pitched it without the camp, afar off from the camp, and called it the tabernacle of the congregation. And it came to pass that everyone which sought the Lord went out unto the tabernacle of the congregation, which was without the camp. And it came to pass when Moses went out unto the tabernacle that all the people rose up and stood, every man at his tent door, and looked after Moses until he was gone into the tabernacle. And it came to pass as Moses entered into the tabernacle, the cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle. And the Lord talked with Moses. Man, isn't the way uh, we can communicate with God much easier 
you know, with spirit and every child of God and with the understanding that God is everywhere, not just in one location. You know, uh, the the way it was set up, um, if you were, it used to be in the center of the camp and he moved it outside. But if you were way away from it, you're talking about two and a half million people you got to negotiate through. It's like starting north of Denver and coming down to Castle Rock before you finally get to the tabernacle. Honey, I'll be back in three days. I got to go talk to God. You got to negotiate all the way through all that. Go to the tabernacle, pray, worship whatever animal, sacrifice, and go all the way back. That had to have been really not good. But when the pillar of the cloud started moving, you know, because they're, they're going to be here 10 months on Mount Sinai. They're going to take off. When they stop, you know, when, um, when the pillar of the cloud moved, the children of Israel moved. When they stopped, Moses put the ark back in the center of the camp and gave instruction as to where each tribe would camp. Now, this is kind of an illustration. It's not drawn the scale. The tabernacle wasn't that big, but it was right in the center of it. And if you notice right below the center here, uh, we've got Moses and Aaron. They camped right at the front of the gate, right in front of the door. That's where they were at. And then the tribe of Judah was camped right in front of them. So. Of course, that's where the Christ line came through. And then along the sides and uh, are all the way around are the other people of all the other tribes. And there's 50, 60,000 of them. So they would expand way out. Okay. Uh, but the other thing I want to point out here is on the edge here, you've got three different groups of people. Those three are the sons of Levi. Levi had three sons who had lots of people. And so since the Levites are now, their job is to, we're moving, the tent's moving. Their job then was to pick everything up and carry it, take it away. So some of the guys had to roll up the tent, some of them had to get the fence post, some of them had to get the Holy of Holies. Uh, they had to get all this stuff, you know, the altar, and take it. So Kohath, Gershon, and Marah were the three sons, and their job were, okay, pick, it's, you know, let's go. And they had to, they had to you know, they were right there. Zhoom. Because that cloud, God, God was with the cloud. It was time to leave, and we follow that cloud. So you better know what you're doing. All of them had assignments. Okay? Verse 10. And when all the people saw the cloudy pillar stand at the tabernacle door, all the people rose up and worshiped, every man in, in the tent door. And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face. And this is a beautiful figure of speech. It means presence to presence. Okay? Uh, as a man speaks unto his friend, and he turned again into the camp, but a servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. God and Moses have a heart-to-heart -heart talk, and Moses pleads with the Lord's return unto the people of Israel. Please, you got to come. You know, if you ain't going, I'm not going either. <laughs> you know, type attitude. All right? Uh, so verse 12, uh, I'm going to read this. Moses said to, to the Lord, look, say you say to me, Bring up this people. But you haven't let me know whom you'll send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name. And if I have found grace or favor in my sight, now therefore, if I found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. They're your people, God. You're supposed to be taking care of these people. And God said, all right, my presence will go with you, and I'll give you rest. You talk me into it. I won't consume everybody down, you know, on the way. So, you know, hey, they're your people. Take care of them. You you called me to lead these guys. Don't blame it on me, okay? You can't take just the angel and send an angel. So what changed the situation around? Moses, acting as a mediator, standing in the gap for the children of Israel. It was his intervention on behalf of the people. Moses' decision to remind God of what he had earlier promised to him was what had changed the Lord's mind against doing what he had every right and every intention of doing. Verse 15 to 17. And he said to him, If your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us so that we are distinct? I and your people from every other people on the face of the earth? The Lord said to Moses, This very thing that you have spoken, I will do. 
for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. God had consecrated the nation of Israel from among the rest of the nations in order to be their God, and for them to be a separated, peculiar people unto him. When Balak tried to hire Balaam to curse Israel, he recognized that they were a protected, distinct people, and mm -hmm. all he could do was bless them instead. Numbers 23, 8, 9, and a few weeks from now we'll cover this record. How shall, but goes, look, how shall I curse whom God has not cursed? How shall I defy whom the Lord has not defied? You know, for from the top of the rocks, I see them. From the hills, I behold them. Lo, the people shall dwell alone and shall not be reckoned among the nations. Moses then is going to make a bold request of God. He wants to behold God's presence. God is spirit, and the spirit cannot be seen with physical eyes. Face is used metaphorically, meaning presence. All the prophets and the men of God who beheld God's glory and heard his voice can say that they have seen the Lord. Right? But all their communication with the Lord were in visions and dreams. No testament, you know. All right, look at John 1:18, Bob. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. Right. You you, you understand and feel and, and be, you know God's presence, right? And you hear God's voice, but all of that, you know, basically in visions and dreams throughout the Old Testament. Nobody has seen God. So let's continue in Exodus 33, 18. And he said, all right, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And I think the Tanakh, which is a Jewish translation, uh, translates this more accurately. And he said, right, let me behold your presence. That's what Moses is saying. To him. Let me behold your presence. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on them and whom I, I want to show mercy to. And he said, Thou canst not see my face. Well, we just read John 1 18. Nobody's seen God. You can't see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. Moses kind of wants to live. And the Lord said, Behold, this is a place by me. Uh, there's a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock. And it shall come to pass, while my glory, or when my presence passes by, that I will put thee in the cliff of a rock, and I will shield you with my hand while I pass by. And I will take away my hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face, forget it. You're not, you're not going to see my face. Once everything had been reconciled with God, it was time to receive the commandments again. The first tables of stones were the work of God. We know from Exodus 31, 18. The second tables are to be hewn by Moses. Both sets were written by God. So here, here's a, uh, a nice view of tables. This actually is in the Egyptian museum of tablets from that time frame. Those are pretty heavy. Moses was able to carry both of them with one hand. And the writings were put on both sides. But God made the tablets the first time. This time he goes, no, 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 you make the tablets. I'll still write on them, but you make the tablets and bring them up. Okay. Exodus 34, 1 to 4. And the Lord said unto Moses, Hew or carve these two tables of stone like unto the first. And I will write upon these tables the words that were in the first tables, which thou breakest. And be ready in the morning, and come up in the morning unto Mount Sinai, and present thyself there to me in the top of the mount. And no man shall come up with thee, neither let any man be seen throughout all the mount. Neither let the flocks nor herds feed before that mount. And he hewed two tables of stone like unto the first. And Moses rose up early in the morning and went up unto Mount Sinai, as the Lord had commanded him, and took in his hand the two tables of stone. Once Moses gets there, God joins the meeting with Moses and continues to speak of his glory. Verse 5, and then you know, Moses comes up. He's got the two blank tablets with him. And the Lord descended in the cloud, stood with him there, and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, slow to anger, abundant in goodness, abundant in steadfast love and truth exceeding loving kindness for thousands, forgiving iniquity, forgiving perverseness, for, and transgression, rebellion, forgiving sin, rebellion, iniquity. 
and that will by no means clear the guilty. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, upon the children's children, unto the third, the fourth generations. God's visiting extended his mercy, but not his wrath. In light of Israel's many iniquities, Moses needed to continue to plead for the children of Israel. So what happens in verse 8? And Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. He paid homage. And he said, If I now, if now I have found grace in thy sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray thee, go among us, for it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for thine, for your own inheritance. Moses paid homage to the Lord and continued pleading with him. God then reminds Moses of what he wants his people to do, to stay clean regarding idolatry. Verse 10, he said, Behold, I am making a covenant before all your people, I will do marvels. And we're not talking marvel comments, right? I'm going to do real marvels. Look at, look, at, look at what he's promising Moses. I'm going to do marvels such as have not been created in all the earth or in any other nation. And all the people among whom you are shall see the work of the Lord, for it is an awesome thing that I will do with you. What a promise from God. Observe what I command you this day. Behold, oh, I'm, I'm coming. And I'm going to drive out before you the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Parasites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Take care, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land to which you go, lest it becomes a snare in your midst. You shall tear down and destroy their altars, destroy their altars, break their pillars, cut down Asherim, which is their groves. For you shall worship no other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Thus you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and when they whore after their gods and sacrifice to their gods, and you are invited, you eat of his sacrifice. And you take of their daughters for your sons, and their daughters whore after their gods, and make your sons whore after their gods. You shall not make for yourself any gods of cast metal, no molten god, no molten images, no gods of cast metal. He then reminds them of many things, like what they are to do with the first fruits, the feast, and a reminder that none were to work on the Sabbath. It was a day of worship and rest. Verse 27. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write thou these words, for after the tenor of these words I have made a covenant with thee and with Israel. And he was there with the Lord forty days and forty nights. He did neither eat bread nor drink water. And he wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. When Moses comes down from the mount after 40 days, he was up to 40 days before. Now he's back up there again for another 40 days. I wonder in his mind, man, I better not see another golden calf. <laughs> you know? He gathers them together and he's going to deliver God's messages to them. Moses is witnessing God's glory and a vi visible effect on him. He saw the hindsight of God and boy, is he going to shine. Verse 29. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, as he came down from the mountain, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone. It radiated, reflected as a mirror, the divine glory, because he had been talking with God. Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses, and behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him, and Moses talked with them. Afterward, all the people of Israel came near, and he commanded them all that the Lord had spoken with him in Mount Sinai. And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. Whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would remove the veil until he came out. And when he came out, he told the people of Israel what was commanded. The people of Israel would see the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face was shining. And Moses would put the veil over his face again until he went in to speak with him. God refers to this record when comparing the law versus the spirit in 2 Corinthians 3. God continues in Exodus 35 with the details of work on the ark. 3521 English Standard Version, and they came. Everyone whose heart stirred him, and everyone whose spirit moved him, and brought the Lord's contribution to be used for the tent of the meeting, for all its service, and for the holy garments. 
So they came, both men and women, all who were of a willing heart brought brooches and earrings and signet rings and arm, uh, armlets, all sorts of gold objects, every man dedicating an offering of gold to the Lord. Verse 25, and every skillful woman spun with her hands, and they all brought what they had spun in blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen. All the women whose hearts stirred them to use their skill spun the goat hair. So there's women involved in the making of the, of, uh, the tabernacle. Verse 29, all the men and all the women, all the people of Israel whose heart moved them to bring anything for the work of the Lord had commanded by Moses to be done, brought it as a free will offering to the Lord. So men and women, they were all involved in giving. Now the next chapters deal with the actual construction of the sanctuary with Moses overseeing that it gets built in strict adherence to the blueprints God had given. All right, Exodus 39, 43. And Moses did look upon all the work, and behold, they had done it as the Lord had commanded. Even so, they even so had they done it, and Moses blessed them. Exodus 40. So Moses finished the work. Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the cloud abode thereon. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And when the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the children of Israel went onward in all their journeys. But if the cloud were not taken up, then they journeyed not until the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was upon the tabernacle by day, and fire was upon it by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. This was where God and Moses would talk. Even though Aaron was the high priest, Numbers mm -hmm. 789 tells us, and when Moses was gone into the tabernacle of the congregation to speak with him, then he heard the voice of one speaking unto him from off the mercy seat that was upon the ark of testimony, from between the two cherubim, and he spake unto him. Now, the Levites were given specific directions in handling and moving the Ark of the Covenant. We talked about this. Numbers 1, 49 says, Only thou shalt number the tribe of Levi, neither take the sum of them among the children of Israel, but thou shalt appoint the Levites over the tabernacle of testimony, over all the vessels thereof, over all the things that belong to it. They shall bear the tabernacle. And all the vessels thereof, they shall minister unto it. And they shall encamp round about the tabernacle. That's why they were the closest ones to it. And when the tabernacle sets forward, when it gets moving, the Levites shall take it down. When the tabernacle is to be pitched, the Levites are going to set it back up again. And the stranger that comes near it, they're going to be put, up, going to, be put to death. And the children of Israel shall pitch their tents, every man by his own camp and every man by his own standard throughout their host. But the Levites, they're going to pitch round about the tabernacle testimony that there be no wrath upon the congregation of the children of Israel, and the Levites shall keep the charge of the tabernacle testimony. They won't let anybody wander over and try and hop the fence and get in. All right, Numbers 8, 24. This is it that belonged unto the Levites. From 25 years old and upward, they shall go in to wait upon the service of the tabernacle of the congregation. And from the age of 50, they shall cease waiting upon the service thereof, and they're going to serve no more. So from 25 to 50, but shall minister with their brethren in the tabernacle of the congregation to keep, to keep the charge, and shall do no service. Thus shalt thou do unto the Levites touching their charge. Okay? The Levites were chosen by God. They were the ones who were going to be moving everything. Now, I have a question. What happened to the Ark of the Covenant? Everybody knows it's in a warehouse in Nevada, right? <laughs> okay. From the Indiana Jones. But I guess they tried to get it out of there. Anyway, during the judges period, it rested at Shiloh, just north, <coughs> excuse me, just north of the Jebusite city of Jerusalem. So Shiloh was just north of Jerusalem. That's where it was at. Uh, that's where Samuel was at. After David took Jerusalem, it was put into the Holy of Holies in Solomon's temple once it was built. The last mention of it in the Bible is in 2 Chronicles 35 in King Josiah, about 35 years before the time of the Babylonian captivity, during the time of the prophet Jeremiah. The temple in Jerusalem was totally destroyed 
at that time in the year 586 BC. And no record of it being taken either into or out of Babylon is mentioned. Jeremiah 28 3 says that whatever was taken into captivity would come out again. Thus, the ark disappeared from Bible history after Josiah mentions it and before the Babylonian exile of 586. Okay. It was most likely hidden by Jeremiah just prior to the destruction of the temple when Jerusalem was surrounded by the Babylonian siege wall. What would happen is when you took when you attacked a city, a walled city, you would build a walled city or a walled area around you that would besiege them far enough out of arrow reach. So you know, they couldn't shoot arrows into it. So the Babylonians had their own siege wall. So somewhere it was hidden within the confines of the city wall of Jerusalem and the Babylonian siege wall. Because not only the temple was totally destroyed, but the entire city of Jerusalem was destroyed also. The writer of the apocryphal book of 2 Maccabees, or Maccabees, all right, utilizing Nehemiah's writings, says that Jeremiah was told by God to hide the ark in the mountain that Moses had seen in the promised land before he died. From Mount Nemo, Moses would have been able to see Jerusalem because of its altitude. So, according to Maccabees, when God uh, when God took Moses up to Mount Nemo, he was able to see into that area, and he could see Jerusalem, and that's where it was hidden, underneath Jerusalem, but outside the siege walls, because Jerusalem was destroyed. All right? 